Hello everyone, and welcome to the 108th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Billy Chapman from Silent Night, Deadly Night. A boy who was forced to suffer horror beyond anything a person should ever have to experience, Billy becomes the ultimate Christmas nightmare, a murderous Santa carving a path through the world to deliver cold turned steel to the naughty boys and girls of the world. In this video, we're going to cover the details that led to Billy's transformation into this jolly monster, and although there are several films and remakes in this franchise, there is only one Billy Chapman, so to do that, we'll only be looking at the original film. But if you're interested in exploring the other representations of this character, let me know down below, and come some holiday season in the future, I may explore their stories as well. Now without further ado, let's head down the chimney with Billy Chapman. To tell the story of Billy Chapman is to tell the story of trauma, abuse, and negligence. In the opening of this film, we find Billy and his parents heading to their grandfather's nursing home to wish him well on Christmas Eve of 1971. Upon arriving, we learn that old man Billy is essentially catatonic, staring off into space without so much as a nod to his family's presence. However, once Billy's parents leave the room, Billy the Elder comes to life and begins conversing with his grandson after he stops him from calling out to his mother, ominously warning him that she couldn't help him even if she came to his aid. He proceeds to teach his grandson about Christmas Eve and Santa Claus, stating to young Billy that Christmas Eve is the scariest night of the entire year, as though Santa Claus may be coming tonight to deliver presents to the boys and girls who have been good all year. Grandpa informs Billy that contrary to popular belief, he doesn't just leave a lump of coal for the naughty children, but instead punishes them. And when Billy answers his grandfather's question as to whether or not he's been good all year with a no, he informs him that he'd better run tonight if he sees Santa Claus. Now whether or not this man is simply a sadistic old curmudgeon who gets a kick out of his inert refuge from his family and the torture of children, or the ghost of Christmas Future who has come alive to warn his grandson of his family's impending doom is unknown. But regardless, the innocence of the young cherub that is Billy here would be ruined by his family's failure to heed the sinister warning imparted upon him by his elder. And as a result, his family falls victim to a stick-up man clad in the dress of St. Nicholas, their lives ending in terror and fear as he slaughters them on a desolate country road in plain sight of Billy, adding an extra layer of trauma to the situation by ripping open his mother's blouse before he slits her throat. Now obviously this is an exceptionally tragic event for a child to witness, and Billy unfortunately develops post-traumatic stress disorder from witnessing this grisly scene. But as we'll cover in just a moment, these murders also cause Billy to associate them with the warning given to him by his grandfather. That warning of course being that he'd be punished for being naughty, a punishment that would end up being the death of his parents. We next encounter Billy three years later during the same time of year, and here we learn that he and his brother have been living in a Catholic orphanage. And this is where we first get to see the manifestation of Billy's PTSD, which is shown to us when he draws a picture of Santa lying murdered beneath a Christmas tree with a decapitated reindeer at his side. Punished for his misdeed by Mother Superior, Billy is made to sit in his room while the other children play outside, though not for long, as Sister Margaret relieves him of his punishment and allows him the freedom to play with the other children. However, Billy unfortunately spies two teens having intercourse on his way down to the yard, and of course, Mother Superior spies him lurking outside the store before she barges in to punish these sinners. After which, Billy is told by her that what he saw in that room was naughty, and that naughty people deserve to be punished, just as she had punished them for their misdeeds. And of course, Billy is unfortunately once again made to suffer punishment at her hand, this time in the form of several lashes of a belt for daring to leave his room without her permission. The naughty boy receiving his due, just like the lovers who dared to break their vows and entwine themselves in lustful sin. And to make matters even worse, Mother Superior, who shows herself to be quite confident in her barbaric methods of therapeutic rehabilitation, chooses to have Billy sit on Santa's lap the following day, assured that he's now cured of his ailment through the divine rod of God which proved to be far from the truth once Billy punched Santa square in the nose, running upstairs afterwards to cower in the corner of his room as he repeated to himself that he would be a good boy. Now with two more traumatic experiences instilled within him to fuel his PTSD, we next encounter Billy as an adult 10 years later during spring, and though he might have been forced to suffer unjustly as a child, our first impression of him is that of a handsome, kind, and charitable young man who seems to have adjusted well to society despite the disadvantages he was given. Billy is seen being a model employee and co-worker, performing his duties with a smile on his face, and even providing excellent customer service to his store's patrons. And as he adjusts, he forms a crush on his co-worker Pamela, whom the prospects of a relationship with grow, as their interactions with one another increases as time goes on. However, that all changes once the holiday season rolls around. 
Thrown into a dour mood by the impending festivities, Billy's demeanor changes from amiable and cheery to disgruntled and agitated, and worry and complaints begin to roll in about the young man who had once shown himself to be a promising addition to his company's workforce, but now appeared to be a man who was hiding the truth of himself through a front of false joviality. While that's true in a sense, it's more the fact that Billy's PTSD, which was both exasperated and repressed by his former mother superior, has never truly been dealt with, and the harsh lessons imprinted upon his young mind of severe punishment for the naughty are bursting through his fragile psyche once again. His attraction to Pamela, further pressing the issue when he has a dream of himself locked in her nude embrace, one that quickly turns into a nightmare when an unseen Santa Claus runs his knife through Billy's side for his naughty behavior, showing us that Billy has developed an aversion to sex due to his first experience with it. And once he awakes in terror, we find Billy cowering in the corner of his room, just as he once had back in the orphanage, following his forced interaction with Santa. Just as his encounter with the murderous Santa began his trauma, and his second sealed within him even more, it would be a third encounter, or rather personification, that would totally destroy Billy's mind. Forced to play Santa after the previous Santa broke his ankle, it's possible that Billy may have thought in this moment that this would be a good opportunity to overcome his fears, become Santa, to conquer Santa. But even if that were true, the likelihood of that happening was slim, as just as beating the PTSD out of Billy didn't work, this form of extreme immersion therapy was almost always bound to fail, considering that he wasn't made to be Santa in an effort to help relieve him of some of his trauma. Billy proceeds to sow trauma himself, as he repeats the lesson imparted upon him by his grandfather to the unfortunate children who come to sit on his lap. And after a day of enduring this torture, Billy joins his co-workers for a little alcohol-fueled Christmas celebrations. And given that Billy declined a drink from Andy earlier in this film, we can assume that this moment might be the first time that Billy ever drank. So now, with an entire season of reliving his trauma, backed up by a day of embodying the source of it, we find a distraught and inebriated Billy at the mercy of his boss, who proceeds to drunkenly and inadvertently recap Billy's trauma with him just after he views Andy and Pamela making out and heading into the stockroom together. And as if all that Billy had experienced in his life and in these past few days wasn't enough to send him over the edge already, his boss proceeds to tell him that he needs to sober up, as Santa Claus needs to get to his very important work on Christmas Eve. Agreeing with his boss, and spurned on by a carol, Billy does just that, shambling off to the stockroom in a stupor, where he finds Andy in the process of sexually assaulting Pamela, a moment that would send him right back to that fateful night in 1971, his mind melding with his felt-bound persona to manifest the same monster that had taken his parents from him all those years ago. Billy proceeds to murder Andy, Pamela, Mr. Sims, and Mrs. Randall, completing his transformation into the dreaded, glassy-eyed, stone-faced murderous Santa Claus that had always been lurking below the surface of his mind. And with Billy now totally destroyed by his trauma, he murders three more people and traumatizes yet another little girl before he reaches his final destination, the St. Mary's Home for Orphan Children, a place where he sought to murder the naughtiest woman of them all, Mother Superior, but he failed in his effort at the last moment as he was killed by Captain Richards, ending the spree of this deadly St. Nicholas before he could cause even more harm. Now with all the events leading up to Billy's spree mired in horrific trauma, abuse, and negligence, it must be understood, just as Sister Margaret understood, that what Billy became was entirely preventable. When Billy came to the St. Mary's home for orphan children, he was traumatized and suffering from PTSD, but his PTSD was something that could have been easily treated with the proper care and understanding of his condition. Sister Margaret was aware of this, and she tried her best to ensure that Billy lived his life at the orphanage as the other children lived, so he might overcome the trauma of his past, and I believe that if given enough time, Sister Margaret may have even acted as his pseudo-therapist, working with Billy to understand that what happened to him when he was younger didn't define him teaching him how to cope with his loss and work through his PTSD. However, Mother Superior ensured that none of that would happen, instead taking charge of Billy's mental health herself, utilizing primitive and cruel practices to beat the bad out of Billy and force him into becoming the child she wanted him to be, giving Billy little to no chance to work through anything that he'd experienced in a healthy way. Thus, while we can blame Billy's grandfather for terrifying his grandson and his parents' killer for traumatizing him, the blame for Billy's transformation can ultimately be placed upon Mother Superior, the woman who rather than helping him heal, brutally suppressed his PTSD through capital punishment and zealous lessons regarding the proper payment for one's sins, imparting even more trauma on him and forcing Billy to bottle up his emotions so they might explode at a later date, which they were always bound to in one way or another.
So in the end, who was Billy Chapman? He was a child forced to live through trauma and then neglect and abuse that caused immense amount of damage to his young psyche. As he matured into an adult, this latent trauma was only exasperated further as his repressed emotions manifested themselves every Christmas season, culminating in the utter destruction of his mind as he succumbed to all that he had experienced during his first attempt to integrate into society. Was Billy evil? The murders he committed certainly were, but they were committed because he was a child scorned, a boy who was given no chance to overcome the horrors of his past. So no, while Billy himself might not have been evil, the fact remains that he was warped and twisted into committing evil actions, and the only people to blame for that are the ones who are to be held responsible for it in the first place. What are your thoughts on Billy? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, to my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.